Welcome to today's edition of the Kingdom Living Podcast with Glenn Reppel. I think you're going to really, really uh, find today's conversation provocative and hopefully maybe busting some uh, religious ideologies that oftentimes we were either brought up with or maybe carried along. And um, Glenn, how are you doing today? I'm just doing fantastic. And I, I am really honored to have Tommy Miller with us here today. This is a, a real privilege because uh, he's been something I've been listening to and just uh, agreeing with uh, because the, the, as, as we've learned, and we've been teaching many of the same things that he's going to be talking about, and he's written books about it. And so we're just excited uh, to have him here with us today. This is a great day. I think it's going to be a fantastic discussion, and I'm so looking forward to the conversation because, Glenn, as you as you just mentioned, you know, there's so many great messages in the Kingdom Living podcast series, like uh, we were talking just before uh, we began the podcast, one called The 6,000-Year Lie, and all these things are kind of eye-opening, and, Glenn, what we always talk about and share is that, um, you know, a lot of this came from, or, or the beginnings of this came from something you've done for a number of years in your business you actually started as a as a ministry tool what you do with GA Repl where you're a financial company and you created this thing God gave you the Repl minute so that you could bring out um a daily motivational biblical piece that would help people as they reminded themselves daily of who God calls them to be and then from that God gave you the book fraud which we talk about all the time and we were just having the conversation that so many people come back and comment to you that this is really a book uh, that's helping them understand their identity. And really, that's when uh, the Kingdom Living podcast kind of grew from that. This is like episode 111, Glenn. And out of that, out of that, what we keep finding is that this isn't an opinion show. We say this over and over. It is literally when you do the teachings, Glenn, you're pulling out scripture and we're just going step by step. And when you look at that and you look at the plan that God has for his kids, it's a, it's it's amazing. And that's why I think today's conversation is going to have so much meaning for so many. I was looking at the title of Pastor Tommy's books and things like that. It's fascinating, Glenn. So kind of with that, I want to remind everybody, you can get all of the materials. There'll be uh, uh, you can you can learn everything you want to learn about kingdom living at the repleminute.com. That's a, the perfect resource center. You can find us on the Facebook at the Repl Minute and certainly on the YouTube channel at the Repl Minute. But what we're going to get in today is going to be fascinating. So folks, buckle your seatbelts and Glenn, let's 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 go for this. Oh yeah, I I, I could go on probably the whole time just. The, the teachings and uh, uh, there's there's more than two books, but the first book that because I, you know, I thought I was alone out there uh, teaching life and immortality uh, uh, in in a, to find out there's there's many others because the question I asked years uh, just really about a year ago is you know so we're not supposed to die we're that death was never the design of God and so in and, and I started reading the Bible and the scriptures through that that context that perception and it went, it just lined up and it just started making sense and and yet at the same time the message uh that we've been trained to is is uh, uh and Tommy you speak to this so much in your in the books and your teaching and the YouTubes and all and and I just want to get people to listen and watch those but 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 the idea is we're, we're taught say, say this prayer uh, yeah. so you can go to heaven and avoid hell uh, but you have to die to get to heaven I mean and that's kind of the the gospel that that's been kind of preached out there and 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 again that's not really what what Jesus brought he was teaching the kingdom of God is now it's present with you and so we've been teaching over the years that the the gospel is a now gospel and it's so nice to have uh, Tommy Miller with us and and Tommy is a husband a father uh, he's got four grandchildren his his wife Sanda uh, and again as you get on his YouTubes and listen to some of the teachings you you're going to just see a continuous teaching of, of a man of God that knows the word of God. And what I really like too, and some of the, some of the teaching and training he does, he answers a lot of questions and these are hard questions. Uh, so he's not afraid to answer questions. And, and again, when I look at his books, uh, Deathless uh, and, trans and Transfigured, um, 
I look at these actually as as commentaries to some extent, where he takes the word of God and and he's he's giving you uh, his thoughts about it, and sometimes it's it's in contrast to what some of the other commentaries say, and and it says, wow, it just makes sense, it lines up with life because, uh, and he makes this a statement here. I'm doing your teaching here, Tommy. Is <laughs> is that because we have a choice, don't we? We have a choice. He talks about the choice and and the. Choice is life or death. And again, that's what we've been teaching all along here too about the two trees, uh, uh, the tree of life and the knowledge of good and evil, which is death. So uh, Tommy, we're just we're just so glad uh, to have you on. And uh, m- maybe one of the first questions, and again, because you, you're so current and so active and speaking all the time, is, is that just share, share with us uh, what the Holy Spirit has on your heart uh, as to what you think that they they would like to hear, because we're so we're so attuned to and again about the word immortality, life and immortality. Are people receptive to hearing this? Because it seems so strange to them. Because we've been, we've been trained so much on death rather than life and life abundantly. Fantastic, gentlemen. First, I, I want to say thank you for having me and um, just honor what you guys are building. I mean, you, you, you're you both clearly men of, of tact and men of integrity, and um, there is a cost associated with, with championing this kind of forerunning message. So so before I get into anything that, that I can offer the folks that are um, that are listening, I wanted to thank you guys both for, for being willing to step out and, and hear from God and, and release these into, into multitudes of people and pay the price associated with it. So um, I value you guys. I value your ministry, your friendship. And uh, super thankful. Um, what what God would have me share um, is that for the first time since the resurrection, maybe since the Constantinian shift, we have good news about the good news. We've never seen what we're seeing right now, and there's a few things that that I've been laying out for our students, and in. Just like any other form of technology, I guess I'd say 2000 years ago, if you wanted to send a letter to somebody, you wrote it down in whatever or whatever kind of dialect you had and you you had a, 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 a utensil, a medium, and you found an animal and you got them to take it somewhere, right? And it seems like our gospel has done the same thing for the last 1800 years. You know, we, the way we send letters, the way we preach the gospel, that changed over the course of 1800 years, or excuse me, that didn't change over the course of 1800 years. Now, within the last 200 years, we went from, um, you know, a letter to uh, a telegram, a telegram to a phone call, a phone call to a pager, a pager to a cell phone, a cell phone to an email, an email to an instant message. And we've just taken this massive, massive acceleration in the way that we communicate. And what we might not realize because we're so close to the gospel is, you know, sometimes we, we, we observe the current state of the Western evangelical church and we think it's in bad shape. And we know where it is, we know where it needs to go, but we don't realize how far it's come and how fast. So that's one of the most exciting things about this message. And like I said, it's good news about the good news. The, the gift of tongues wasn't practiced for, I mean, you know, on, on a large scale for 1800 years. And then all of a sudden somebody sees it in scripture they, they pay the price to teach it and restore it to the body. And then the following generation gets to walk in the revelation freely. That happened with tongues. That happened with the, the fivefold ministers. That happened with healing. That happened with deliverance. All of these things have been regularly restored back to the body over just a course of a very short time. So we're simply alive and obedient during a time where God is restoring the gospel of life and immortality back to the body. And this is going to follow the same phase. It's going to be discovered and revealed. It's going to be taught by forerunners. It's going to be received by the masses. And then it's going to be freely lived mm-hmm. in, in, the, in the body of Christ. So we're, we're, we're witnessing this really intentional and succinct transition that um, that looks just like what happened with our communication. You know, we went 1,800 years with no movement, and all of a sudden we just hit this curve and came into this straightaway where we're going 10,000 miles an hour. The body of Christ isn't going to know what hit it. And and like you said, Glenn, we've we've been teaching this for six or seven years, and for the longest time it was it was only to our students, and it was only to people that were like minded. 
And the unique thing about this message is that this is the only message that you can teach that is actually a reminder to the person that's hearing it. All other messages that we've we've ever come through in Western evangelicalism, you know, the, the, the heaven hell doctrine, the doctrine of original sin, progressive sanctification, all of the, the ones that we made, those things have to be filtered through reason, received by intellect, and then believed or disbelieved. The message of life and immortality, specifically mentioned in 1 Timothy, is the only message that was according to God's gift and grace before the foundation of the world that is now not taught, just revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So I remember being really apprehensive about teaching this, and my apprehension was largely unwarranted because most of the time I just assumed that I was um, going to be received as a heretic. People think I was crazy. But even if they've never had a grid for this message before, it, it hits them and they look around for a little bit. You can see them reason and consider. Then they're like, you know what? That's about the only thing that ever made sense. I knew there was something wrong with what I believed. I didn't know what it was. I didn't have a better option. But now who I was before the foundation of the world bears witness with what's being revealed to me now. And this message serves as a reminder to what was in him before the foundation of the world and not something new for me to receive. People, uh, Mark Sharon said it in a message long time ago, Voice of the Prophets. He said, everybody who has ever gathered around a casket, no matter if it's for a nine-year-old or a 90-year-old, knows this should have never happened. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, God puts eternity in the heart of every man. Fantastic stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, thank you. And, and, and again, um, what does this look like as, as this message goes on uh, that, and, and Jesus talks and, and, it, and it's so neat uh, with these scriptures where he says, uh, if you eat of my body uh, and, and drink of my blood, you'll never die. Right. And, and, and he had just really preached, uh, or he had just fed the 5,000. So he, he's talking about his body. We, we have immortality with that. Mm -hmm. and, and again, and when we have this hunger, we have this hunger for the word of God, because that's the other part in our teaching here too, uh, Tommy. And I so appreciate with you, because it is, it's getting people hunger to feed themselves with the word of God. And as we've said so many times, if if what we're speaking here is not the truth, it's just Glenn or Tommy or, or, or Carrie, uh, then don't pay attention. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, then then listen to this. And because God is spirit and truth. And, and so a part of this, Tommy, uh, is, is the question in, in Romans 8, it talks about uh, the manifestation of sons here on earth. Mm -hmm. uh and what, what what does that what does that look like uh because 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 as this is being revealed to us now what is the what does this what's that look like as sons uh uh ruling and reigning here on earth that's a fantastic question Ro romans 8 is is probably one of the most articulate demonstrations of what we should expect for our future one of the, the, the main things to hone in on in that passage is almost every answer that you need is found in Romans chapter 8. It talks about, um, you know, to live uh, according to the flesh is death. If you, if you set your mind on the things of the flesh, you will die. Um, but if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It says the, the mind of the flesh is death. The mind of the spirit is life and peace. Like it, it keeps going back, uh, back and forth between these two systems of government. And then, and then it identifies what a manifest son of God is. It says those who live by the spirit are sons of God. And creation is crying out with birth pangs. Contrary to popular belief, it's not begging to die. It is begging to live. It's crying out with birth pangs for the manifestation of sons of God. And I think that's probably the most important piece to pay attention to. We went through a, a hyper grace movement and I was, I was a 
part of the hyper grace movement. I'm, I'm a tremendous believer in covenant theology. I, I love understanding God's depth in, in the vastness of his love for us. But sometimes the grace movement without the message of life can leave you in what I call positional sonship. That means you believe that you, you, you receive those things as true about you, but you never require evidence of them. And the way that the way that we describe this system to our students is creation will never be delivered from its frustration by your spirit. Creation is delivered from its frustration by your body. So when when God set this thing up in Genesis 1, and that's another thing that, that, that is really important to pay attention to, is Genesis is a seed. Genesis is a framework. And if Genesis as a seed were allowed to be naturally planted and then never interrupted by the fall, then the fruit of the seed of Genesis would be immortal human beings that look just like their father, ruling and reigning over creation that looks just like heaven. So redemption should bring us back to that place. So now, the book Transfigured is about this very topic. It's about a system of internal governance that gives you the ability to govern creation. And everything in the kingdom has rank and file. Everything in the kingdom has order. Um, and where that where disorder exists, it brings what the Bible refers to as sin or distortion. So what, do, what does this look like to, to get back to the original question? Creation is subject to a human. God says, let us make them in our image and let them have dominion. So creation is subject to your body. Your body is subject to your soul. And your soul is subject to your spirit that is commingled and completely unified with, with the creator of the universe. There is no distinction between you and him. That system of governance is the system of governance that Romans 8 is talking about. If you are led by the flesh, you'll die. That, that's, that's literal, meaning if, if your senses are what is feeding the information to your soul, your soul will feed that information right back to your body. And we get this, this, um, this phenomenon that we call at our school, you're only ever as good as it's going. You can, you can never get into a system of dominion because you're always being dominated by the things that are supposed to be subject to you. Creation now is determining your reality rather than you determining creation's reality. So that system of government that it, that it talks about in Romans chapter 8 is the most significant piece of this, the practicality of this. And, you know, 8 through 12, there was a it was an old theology book. It might be on my shelf here. It might, I think it might have even been a moody theology book. It said that Romans 1 through 7 is the, the, the theology of the new creation covenant. And then 8 through 12 was the walkology of the new creation, hmm. meaning this, this is how it's put into action. So Romans 8 says, if you're led by the flesh, you'll die. If you're, if you're led by the spirit, then you'll have life and peace. The intention of that system of government is that you're, you, the things that you think, the things you feel, and the things that you do, which would be how we define the human soul, aren't influenced by the things that are outside of it. They're influenced by the one that is governing it from the inside. When I, I say one intentionally, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that you and the Lord have become one spirit, intangibly and inseparably in union. And that governs your mind, will, and emotions. Your, your soul governs your body. One of the things that I do often is, um, is I try to put as much neurological and biological evidence to the function of the word just, you know, for, for a long time, the, the, the man-made Western doctrines had no evidence. You know, it's just like, I believe it because it says it. And we said, you know, stupid things like that, which is, you know, it's better than a lot of positions that you could be in. But your gospel should be something that people can witness. So your body is a slave to your soul. If you believe you're in danger, your body will take on the message of that danger. You know, you, you'll be able to feel that dread. You'll be able to feel what, whatever you're anticipating. And then your, your biology responds to your neurology. So your body being a slave to your soul, if your soul is being governed by your spirit, then divinity 
makes its way all the way into your biology. And that is transfiguration. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. In that experience that Jesus had on the Mount of Transfiguration wasn't relegated just to him. As a matter of fact, if we follow just through, you know, past Romans 8, we get to Romans chapter 12. And Romans chapter 12 puts <laughs> 8, 9, and 10 um, kind of in a in, 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 in parenthetical notation here where it says, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be metamorphuo, transfigured by the renewing of your mind. So it's a short way to say everything that he just said in Romans chapter 8. So the intention of the gospel is to get what's true about you in the spirit, to be what you believe about yourself and your soul, and to be what everybody witnesses when they encounter you in your body, so that creation responds to your freedom. The hope of the gospel for creation is its redemption. The hope of the gospel for you and I, Romans chapter 6, says the hope to which we were called is the redemption of our bodies. Not the redemption of our eternity, the redemption of our bodies. So I think it's I think it's practical, and I think we're seeing evidence of it in, in just, just this sound coming out of the body of Christ is giving longevity. There's there's actually neurologists that are believing that the first people to live to a thousand years have been born already, simply because they're seeing things turn on and turn off in the human genome that that used to be susceptible to death and they no longer are. Fantastic question, Glenn. Thank you. Hopefully that was and, and again, it, it's so key because it seems like science is ahead of us that are Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, science, science is saying, hey, the, and, and again, I, just one of your statements in the book is this body was designed to live. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the total design, the cellular structure, the nerve structure, just everything's designed to live. But we, and again, you do such a good job too of, of just so, so, in, you know, as a, as a person thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so you're just, the, the combination of spirit, soul, and body is just so important uh, that, that maybe you could just kind of talk about that too, is, is that renewing of our mind, how important that is, because because as, as we take those uh, thoughts of, and again, of the fear of death, uh, and replace that with the life uh, that, that we have, it's just, it's just retraining that mind. Do you want to kind of talk about the mind a little more and how that impacts the body? Sure. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that, that we need to get good at, at grasping is, is Jesus came in his incarnation and refused to sidestep any of the things that you and I would face. And he refused to, to overcome them using tools that you and I didn't have access to. So he became a vicarious victor as a sufficient savior that faced everything that you and I would face. And this is the most important piece of it. And but contextually, it's really important that we understand how, how it was termed in the Greek. So it says Jesus was tempted just as you and I are in every way, yet he was without sin, right? That means that the things that were going on around him didn't cause him to misbehave. The word sin is ha morphe, meaning distorted miros, uh, distorted form. So that meant that no matter what happened around him, it never determined what was in him. So that that changing of the mind, that 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 process has an atmosphere that's necessary for you to step into transfiguration. The atmosphere necessary for you to step into transfiguration is opposition. That's the strange thing about this gospel. Luke chapter four says that by patience, you would possess your own soul. Patience is the Greek word hupomone, which means to stand under a trial or stand or stand under something heavy for a long time. So you, you literally get to see Jesus walk through this in three chapters in the gospels. And he, he walks through what we would call positional theology or positional sonship through, through a, I don't want to call it a testing or a temptation, but that, I guess that's what it was called in the, in, in the Gospels. And then you see him literally transfigured on the mountain directly following that. And the two times that God spoke audibly from heaven in the Gospels, the first time he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he said nothing else. And then we get a chapter and a half. And then when he saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Right. 
So, so he went from a positional son, you know, what God said about him was true. And then he went through this phase that that's, that's the most important thing that we're going to talk about in a moment um, to God confessing the same thing about him. Only now it was listen to this guy. He's in charge. This is the one that has dominion. What he went through in the meantime, and it ties back to that Romans 8, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, right? The, the, when Jesus was, was baptized in the Jordan River, the Holy Spirit alighted upon him in bodily form like a dove. And then that spirit led him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, right? What a strange bump in our theology, right? He led him to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus literally comes to the opportunity to be governed by his senses and temptation or be governed by the word that was just spoken over him. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Satan says, if you are the son of God, turn that rock into bread. And he says, I don't have to. He said, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So he's literally declaring his species as a son of God. He's not a biological species. He is a supernatural species. He's not sustained by biological things. He governs over biological things. He's sustained by invisible word. He's, in, he's sustained by spirit food. The next temptation he walks into is, is he's literally tempted to jump off the highest part of a temple. And his response to the devil, which is one of my favorite responses, he says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And our religious minds cause us to read that in, I should not tempt my God. But understand this conversation is between Jesus and the devil. And he's telling the devil not to tempt the Lord, his God. He's confessing again his supernatural position, his union with the Father, and his position over darkness. He has the opportunity to be tempted but he never let the temptation become something else in him. He recognized his divine nature the entire way through. The next time he said, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you everything that you see. And he said, go away. You shall worship the Lord your God alone. He's literally confessing the devil should worship him rather than the other way around. After this, after this, he heals everybody that comes to him. People start bringing people from cities, droves, in, in droves, and he heals all their sickness and disease. Then he's transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. So, so the process, what does this actually look like? You have to be in an environment of opposition and choose to be governed by invisible word rather than be governed by the things that are coming through your senses and through temptations. And the more you do that, the more you bring your soul into your, your own ownership, the way the Bible would say it. And then that soul becomes the, the animation to your mortal body so that divinity can be expressed in creation. Well, Tommy, that, I think that leads into the 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 uh, the three heaven uh, teaching too, is sure. which, which really helped me understand uh, uh, positionally uh, how how that would work. And and so mm -hmm. let, let me just kind of reiterate what what I think I hear you saying. So so the body that we exist is the same transfigured body that Jesus has had uh, during that period of time that's the same body that we have spirit soul and body with the, with the godhead living inside of us that that's what i'm hearing you say mm -hmm. yeah good yeah so so talk about the three heavens <laughs> so i i stole the language from chris blackaby and uh, i always give him credit when i teach it because he always tells me that i don't have to he says, there's, there's no copyright on Revelation if you believe it, it's yours. So because of the massive amount of integrity that that guy carries, I always make sure that I, that I, um, that I always tie, the, tie those things back to him. He's a, he's a tremendous forerunner in our movement. Um, the three heavens gives us a, a grid for understanding how, how the church has come along throughout history and what God desires to do concerning governance now. So the way that we define the three heavens is the first heaven are the things that are seen and created. You know, if you can put your hand on it, knock on it, touch it, whatever, um, that, that is the first heaven reality of which your body occupies. The second heaven reality is the unseen but still created realm um, that we refer to as the soulish realm. That's angels and demons and principles and uh, principalities. Um, those kind of things live there. I say principalities as an entity. I say principles as a as a um, as a mode of uh, conducting yourself. So, like 
Um, there's still trading involved. Sowing and reaping is, is a 60-fold term. Uh, it's a 60-fold principle. Um, confessing, putting faith in something, those are all 60-fold things. And realistically, the best of the best charismatic churches usually hit the top of the 60-fold the 100-fold church is the unseen, uncreated realm in God himself, right? Which is, which is, there's no tree of knowledge of good and evil there. There's no duality present there. There is no sickness. There is no death. There is no disease. So um, to give you an example of the, the, the subtle difference between what we would call 60-fold and 100-fold, uh, 60-fold is where ministry takes place. If you're sick and I heal you, we have to have two trees, Right. The 100 fold is you aren't sick because he isn't sick and you're in him and no other reality exists. What we're stepping into regarding the 100 fold is a place of governance. Rather than living on earth out of heaven's supply, asking God for revival or asking God to do something, he invites us into himself to rest. He invites us into himself to live and he invites us into himself to govern from where he's governing from. So if we are to redeem something, we can't be dependent on it. So if God desires that we redeem creation, we can't be part of creation. We have to govern apart from the foundation of the world so that we're no longer subject to the pangs of creation. So he takes us out of Adam, in Adam all die, and now he gives us the ability to identify with the one that blew the breath into Adam's nostrils rather than the one that received the breath into his nostrils. Adam was a living soul. Jesus is a life-giving spirit. So rather than functioning in a first heaven reality, which is just natural, it's like um, if you get a headache, you take an ibuprofen and it goes away. That's a natural problem. That's a natural solution. Um, the 60-fold would, would be natural problems, but you ask for heavenly solutions. You know, if you got a headache, you can start binding and loosing and fasting and confessing and you know, all of those things in the, in this, in the 100 fold, you simply don't have a headache because he doesn't have a headache and you rest in the truth of the finished work of him, of who he is. So understanding those realms mean that means that you understand how, how internal governance works. So you, you govern the second realm from the third, you govern the first realm from the second, and then you govern creation from the first realm. Your body is heaven's point of contact with creation. So your body has to be under the government of heaven in order to have dominion here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and again, in 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 which is so neat too is that God knew us before the foundation of the the world of the earth, and and uh, somehow one of the things I got out of the book too, which is really helpful, is is I, I, I had the mindset. Uh, and because I, I speak that, but 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 he knew us, but then Adam came in and just mm -hmm. teaching on on the first Adam and the second Adam. Uh, and yet we're we're back before in the beginning, and let's talk talk about that the beginning, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, too. What, what, what's what's that? What, what's that really mean in, in the today language? Yeah, so so that, that's a wonderful question, also. So the implications of who you identify, identify with, those, those determine your identity and your destiny. And <clears throat> the, the language that I use to describe this sometimes can sound shocking, but the, the Bible says, okay, so I'm not making this up, that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So although Genesis is true, you don't find truth until you read John. Genesis is the natural history of creation and God's intention for the future of his natural seed. John is the actual framework for creation that was not available to be revealed to us until Christ came and brought it. So, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So Genesis says, in the beginning. John 1 says, in the beginning. They're not talking about the same beginning. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for beginning doesn't talk about a, a, um, <clears throat> a, a linear time span. It talks about a framework or the, 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 the biblical word alpha, right? 
So if, if your beginning is Genesis, then your identity is Adam. And if your identity is Adam, then your portion is death. All die in Adam. Your Genesis can't be Genesis. Your Genesis has to be John. And John is even unique in the way that he finds Jesus in the lineage, because two other gospel authors had a page and a half of begots. And those begots went through Jesus's natural lineage. John says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. That's the, the only, how do I say this? The only avenue from heaven to earth was that. Right, so so both Glenn and Carrie aren't the product of six thousand years worth of human lineage that landed them here, with with epigenetics and with nature and nurture, and now they're a sum total of their their um, environment and experiences. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was was with God, and the Word became Carrie, and the Word became Glenn. And you were in him before the foundation of the world. Now you're present in this world as a unique expression of that word to bring the reality of that word into his creation. It is, it is desperately important to understand that you were found in Christ before you were ever considered lost or dead in Adam. Your reality in Christ is far more real than your reality in Adam. You were you were lost in Adam. If if you were lost in Adam, it was only because you had a perception that you weren't in Christ for a moment. The the I, th I think the best language in the book of John that describes this is John chapter fourteen. He's talking about sending the Holy Spirit and the language that he uses. He doesn't say in that day uh, it'll happen or in that day this will take place. He says in that day you'll know I'm in you. You're in me. We're in the Father. The Father, the Son, and humanity are all one, inseparable, indistinguishable. You can't tell where one begins and the other one ends. And it was that way from before the foundation of the world. The union between Christ and humanity is so intimate that by loving humanity, Christ is loving himself. Hmm. Your framework is an Adam. Your framework is Jesus. The language that John uses, and without him, nothing was made that was made. That means you are literally cut from the fabric of divinity, thrown into the span of time and space so you could be God on earth. Incredible news. Much better than repeat my prayer, join my clever, go to hell when you die, right? <laughs> but but that's that's what we grew up with, Tommy. Uh, that, that, that thinking is, uh, you know, hit him over the head with it. And uh, boy, this is truly good news. This is it really is. the good news. That we are immortal, that we're designed that way. We're designed to live and have life abundantly, and that's what that's what Jesus has, has said all, all along. Uh, so 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 good, so good. Uh, and and uh, Tommy, because uh, you're out there speaking all over, uh, uh, what are some of the questions that people are asking you also? Uh, uh, you know, it, because, you know, I, and it, we, we, I, I get some of these, but, but uh, I, I know you, cause you're, you're out there. What, what are some things that, you, that they're asking you that uh, is a common question you see? Sure. I think when people hear this message, um, it's easy for them to identify that it's true. What they have a difficult time reconciling is how did we get it so wrong? A lot of times the, the most, um, uh, I, I would say that one of the most useful things you can do is find the origin of some of, some of the doctrines that we've believed um, and how, how crazy it is that we, we believe them, actually. So usually when people receive this message, for, I, I'd say this, I'd separate questions from people that are um, skeptical from people that are receiving it, but want to know like, well, then where did the heaven hell thing come from? Where, where did the focus on the afterlife come from? Um, so those, those are some of the best questions that I get. Um, and I love walking people through things like that. Um, most of the questions from skeptics are then why, why haven't we seen it yet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the truth is we, we have, 
you know, <laughs> um, there, there is a, I'm going to say innumerable only because it's not specified in scripture, but Jesus is not the only human being that has overcome death. Hebrews 2 says he's the only one that we need. The author of Hebrews says that, that all of creation has been placed under the jurisdiction of humanity, but we don't see it yet, but we do see Jesus. So the author of Hebrews recognized that, that our experience shouldn't dictate our expectations. Jesus should dictate our expectations. And if Jesus was the only person that overcame death, then that should be enough evidence for you and I to realize that it's possible. Because everything else that he did, he did vicariously as an example to show us how humanity and divinity should conduct themselves on earth. But we have Enoch. We have Elisha. We have an innumerable number of holy men in Matthew 27 that got out of their graves in the resurrection and went into the city and started preaching. Um, we don't have records of their, their deaths. Again, I believe that they, you know, rode the train to heaven as well. Um, so it's not impossible. And, and one of the, the amazing things of, about history is that there's nowhere in history. We've only started to deny the, the reality of the resurrection within the last 100 years of human history. For 1900 years, the resurrection was an undeniable piece of human history, not even religious history. Anybody in any realm, in any, what, what do I say, um, philosophical background, would have known. There was a prophet that died three years later, the guy got up. And the, one of the reasons Peter was so confident in, in his message, he said, we don't follow cunningly devised fables. We saw him. 500 people saw him after he was buried for three days. We, we, have, we have the sustenance. <laughs> We have the evidence that we need for our message. So the, the question, you know, why has this happened? Um, why haven't we seen it yet? It's been 2,000 years since the resurrection. Um, I, I think it's because we've exalted death as a savior, and we've, we've, we've set our own expectations to depart this place rather than occupy it. Um, there's, a, there's a teacher from uh, Tulsa named David Roberson, and he's, he's since passed away, but he wrote a book called The Walk of Spirit, Walk of Power. Um, and in that book, he he uh, tells about a, a vision that he had where he saw the fivefold ministry on one side of his mirror, you know, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. And then on the other side of his mirror, he realized that there is another fivefold structure, uh, powers, principalities, mights, dominions, and rulers in high places. And those structures, um, one is an authentic and one is a counterfeit, but they both have the same job. So an apostolic voice is responsible to do the same thing a ruler in a high place is supposed to do. They're supposed to create culture and set doctrine. Not satanic doctrine, false doctrine. So, so it's Jesus literally called legalism the doctrine of demons. He recognized who the author of those kind of doctrines were. And our doctrines that, that don't exalt Jesus as a savior, that replace our expectation of life with an expectation of an eternity, that replace Jesus as a savior with death, those, those things were, were influenced by, by a ruler, by something with an apostolic nature that was supposed to counterfeit the apostolic structure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That sure changes our thinking, doesn't it? That 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 is so, because because that that's a part of it. We we've grown up listening to man versus what the Word of God is speaking to us because it's right there and He's teaching it to us. And so because we just brought in these tradition, you know what nullifies the Word of God? It's the the, the traditions and the doctrine. And uh, so and, and again, that's one of the reasons the book Fraud was written. And and gosh, Tommy, where you're at with Deathless and Transfigured, uh, it's just something that I just really think everybody needs to get a hold of. I went and bought several copies of it uh, to get, give out to our small group. And oh man, we're, we're having so much fun just 
uh, sharing it because that's that's a part of it because we're 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 the, the Holy Spirit is revealing the truth to us. Uh, these are great times to be alive right now, uh, very much because see that's the other part with the, the three heavens. Uh, there's no fear in heaven. <laughs> uh, that that's down there, you know. And so so we we operate in so the COVID taught us so much uh, about the lies, also about sickness and disease and death. So we start believing in the sickness and disease that we're going to die. Guess what? That tells our body, oh, mm -hmm. you got to check out. Uh, and if we're teaching that also uh, in, in, in a religious framework, we're, we're missing that the whole intent is for us to manifest the earth now yeah. uh, and, and, to be, and, and to operate uh, as, as kings and priests now. So good. Fantastic. Well, Tommy, any closing comments here that, that you'd like to share? Because I, I just appreciate you coming on and, and just... Uh, just the like-mindedness and what you're doing. And, and I know it's going against the grain uh, of, of what we've learned over these years. And it's so neat to hear people uh, speaking the truth of the word of God. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's, it's been an absolute honor. I would just invite people that are still skeptical um, just, just to take a, an honest and objective look at, at God's history with humanity Um the, the, the choice from the beginning has been the choice between life and death. Even when we moved into the Mosaic law, there, there, was, no, there was no reward for following the law. When, when, the, when Paul talks about honoring your father and mother in the New Testament, he says that is the only commandment with a reward. And the reward is that it would be well with you. <laughs> That's it. You just follow the law so you don't die. <laughs> but it's not heaven and hell. It's, it's not these big grandeur, um, glorious things. The, the, the choice in the law was live or die. The issue from the beginning was live or die. The solution to the world's problems is life. The solutions to the world's problems isn't heaven. And, and Jesus made sure 2,000 years ago, that death would no longer have the final say over any human being ever by introducing himself as the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection to those who die, and he is the life to those who live and believe him. They will never die. He's both. So even, even the people that have departed from this tent, they still have the promise of the redemption of their body. An objective look at, a, at Hebrews chapter 11 lists a bunch of people who are asleep in Christ, and then it tells you that they are not perfect. They are not perfect. Perfection isn't heaven. Perfection is in a body. Those, those who died will not be made perfect apart from you. Resurrection is the hope of the gospel. Life is the hope of the gospel, not a non-material afterlife that you're not conscious of. Yeah, amen. Well, Tommy, thank you so much. And uh, uh, we really want, want everybody to get copies of the, of the book, Deathless and Transfigured. You can go on uh, Amazon and pick those up. And really want to encourage you also to go, go into uh, his website, and we'll have a QR code at the end here that you can uh, get all kinds of teachings that he's got. I've gone through uh, several of those and uh, and just listen to them. And, and because you got to listen to them over and over because you got to retrain your brain and your thinking because we've been trained under man's thinking when actually the Holy Spirit is trying to retrain us into life. We've been trained on death rather than life. And we have life more abundantly. So, Tommy, thank you so much. Gentlemen, thank you, guys. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. You know, what a great conversation this has been. And I was thinking, uh, Glenn and Tommy, as you guys were um, having the conversation back and forth, uh, that this is really uh, uh, such an interesting area to, to have this conversation about because um, we all understand the the that that. Uh, there is a distinction between the first Adam and, and, if you will, the second Adam, because that is what really creates 
um, the reality. And, you know, even like we talked about Hebrews 11, 11, you know, everything which does appear appears out of, you know, I think it was a whole uh, interesting conversation that you were having about that. And Glenn, it still comes back to me as we as we as we kind of close the conversation that so much of this has to do with again you, getting a, a, a an understanding of the reality of who God sees you as. And I was thinking as Tommy was laying this out, and you talk about when you teach the green line um, um, that you were created to be this eternal being, and that how through the fall of Adam we wind up on the red line in the carnal, and then. Uh, through the redemption of Christ, we wind up back on the green line as God originally had intended. So it's just fascinating conversation. And, and like you said, we've put up on the screen here the QR code so you can access the um, the, the teachings uh, we were talking about. And I guess they both came out this year, right? Transfigured and then Deathless, right? Yeah. So those are both available. And then you'll find uh, also on the screen here that you can find a lot of resources that are going to help you in your kingdom building journey. Glenn, we call it Reach Your Purpose. You're going to find them at thereplminute.com because it's a great place you can find the entire library of Kingdom Living podcasts. You can also find the Repl Minute, uh, that daily Monday through Friday uh, encouraging moment that we talk about so much. But you can also find com the complete uh, fraud series and order your own copy of Fraud, what God has to say about tactics of the enemy there. So, Glenn, I know we always wind up uh, at the end and ask you to pray for everybody within the sound of our voice. Uh, and, you know, as as we watch over time and God keeps um, uh, granting more and more uh, viewers, listeners on the podcast and everything, people watching on the Facebook or the YouTube or wherever they they access this, uh, it, the footprint reaches globally now. And this the the message is so vitally important, Glenn. Yeah, we're just so thankful that you've tuned in and watched and uh, uh, cause, cause we know God's word does not return void and it's impacted. It, it's purpose is planting those seeds. Uh, and that's from the beginning, from the very beginning. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We, we thank you uh, that your word did become flesh and dwelt among us. And we're made in that likeness, that image. Uh, you're living inside of each one of us. As Tommy was talking about the John 14 scriptures, uh, uh, is so, so important that you're in us, we're in you, and we are one, the oneness that we have in you, in, in our identity that we've got. Father, we, we thank you for this time spent together because we know we're outside of time. We're, uh, we're eternal beings. Uh, and your word is in our hearts. And Father, uh, we just pray that uh, the people listening and watching, that they'll receive this word today. Uh, Father, we just lift this up in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And thank you, viewer, for joining us for today's edition of the Kingdom Living Podcast with Glenn Reppel. Again, visit us at repelminute.com. And then don't forget, uh, if this has had meaning for you, by all means, like and share it. And uh, thank you again. And we will see you. Uh, we will see you next time on the Kingdom Living Podcast. Until then, God bless you.